what is there like gaining knowledge? Anne Lister and the scientists in Paris. Hello, and welcome to this talk. It was first given on the 3rd of April, 2023, at the West Yorkshire Archive Service Calderdale in Halifax during the Anne Lister Birthday Festival. A big thank you to the archive for the permission to record it. My name is Susanne Piotrowski. What is there like gaining knowledge? All else below is indeed but vanity and vexation of spirit. I am happy among my books, and Lister wrote on 2nd of May, 1829 in Paris. She was ready to start properly with her studies in the French capital. First, I like to show you some pictures of the Jardin de Plant and buildings of the Musée National d'Histoire Naturelle that you can still see today. So here you can see the amphitheater and Lister attended most of the lectures of the museum in this building. And of course, she got the permission to enter through the professor's entrance and not through the student's one. The building on the left side is the Hotel de Magny. And it was in Anlister's time and is now the administration. And Anlister often went there to inquire about lectures or to sit and read there between lectures when the weather was bad. The Grand Serre, the great greenhouses. On the left side, the older ones, she visited very often. And then on the right side, these are the new ones built in 1836-37, uh, which she saw in 1838 when she came to Paris with Anne Walker. And on the drawing, on the left side, on the far left end of the picture, you can see a little construction, and this is the Belvedere. Alistair often walked there and had a splendid view over Paris. On the right side, you can see the Maison de Cuvier, Cuvier's house, where she often called and sat with his wife and his stepdaughter, and where she attended his soirees. The Galerie d'Anatomie Comparée, this is the former one. It was founded by Cuvier. Um, and there are other lecture rooms in this building as well. Uh, today, the collection is so huge that this is now in a different building. So, she was, so why or when did Alistair the thought of coming to Paris? And she talked to the, her tutor, Monsieur Antoine. Um, he asked, what first put it into my head to come here and attend the Jardin de Roi? Said it might be almost called an idée innée, innate idea. But that reading the introductions to Cuvier's great work, translated many years ago into English by Kidd, had settled me in my determination, and I have been bent on coming here ever since the age of 14 or 15. So, you may know that during Anne's lifetime, it was impossible for women to study at a university. In England, it wasn't before 1868, in France, 1863 that the first women were allowed at universities. So how could Anne attend lectures? That's because France had something other countries hadn't, the French Revolution. Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité led to changes at institutions. In 1793, the Jardin de Roi became the Jardin de Plantes, and on its grounds, the Musée National d'Histoire Naturelle was established. It had one director who was one of the 12 professors of the different fields of natural science. Its tasks were and are research, education of the people, and the management of the huge collections. The lectures had to be held for free for everybody and on French at a time when at universities everything was done in Latin. And that's why a blue like Anne Lister, who called the July Revolution nonsense, could profit from a revolution. 
In 1829, her language skills were good enough to begin seriously with studying. After visiting first for a few times, a lecturer in 1827 at the Institut de France. All lectures she attended were held in the museum, but one given by Georges Cuvier, who lectured at the Collège de France. And in 1880, she wrote a letter to Georges Cuvier to ask him to help her with the studies. And timetable was so packed that sometimes she needed to skip one lecture for another, or that she had to leave before the end to hurry to the next one. And there were two teachers she took private lessons with. And of course, Anne Lister wouldn't be Anne Lister without being in Paris when one of the most important debates in natural science took place there. No less than the possibility of evolution was discussed between two of the men she admired most, and you can see a glimpse of what Miss Lister might have thought about this subject because her thirst for all things scientific and her faith were questioned. Now I'm going to present the scientists and you will see that many of them established new fields of science. I will tell you a bit about each scientist and then I'm going to read quotes from Anderson's diary about them. So, Jean-Victor Antoine, he was the first she met at the museum in the administration and he became a kind of tutor to her. And unfortunately, she always misspelled his name. She never got it right once. <clears throat> he was a naturalist, entomologist, and ornithologist. And first he studied law, then medicine, then zoology, and became an assistant at the museum in 1824. In 1833, he became the professor for entomology. And in 1838, he became a member of the Académie des Sciences, like many of his colleagues. He helped Anne to find the right lectures. He helped her to buy skulls and skeletons. He helped to find her little apartment. And he introduced Monsieur Julia to her, the medical student with whom she took lessons in anatomy and in dissecting. And Monsieur Andouin's and his wife were social contacts. And you can see his wife, Mathilde, <clears throat> on the right side. Quotes. Then drove to Monsieur Antoine's in the Rue de Seine, close to the Jardin de Plante. Introduced to him and to attend his course of lectures to commence next month on the Molluscae. Monsieur Antoine, a thin, studious looking young man, began by begging indulgence, not used to speak in public, but lectured very well and very clearly. In fact, the best lecturer of them all, not excepting Cordier. Monsieur Antoine, the best lecturer of the set, always makes a subject interesting, dry and deficient as might be in other hands. Sat with my aunt, expecting Monsieur Antoine. Of all the questions I asked, not one of them not clearly and satisfactorily answered. Promised me a small collection of shells, etc., from duplicates at the Jardin de Rouen. Will help me in anatomy. To go tomorrow after Cuvier's lecture to a shop to get a crown, a skull. Monsieur Antoine, a thorough servant, clear as are all those who well understand the subject, said I should be guided by him in my studies, should always be grateful to the Jardin de Rouen, and should be glad to make some progress and to credit to my instructions. Monsieur Antoine there went with me as promised last night about the crown, ordered a head of a dog a cat and a rabbit, to be altogether ten francs. To have them on Saturday, a very good male skeleton, 124. Then took Monsieur Antoine home, saying I wished to speak to him. I could not get on by myself in anatomy. Monsieur Antoine will arrange with the young student to come and give me lessons. Thinks that with lessons twice a week for a couple hours each, I may in month's time master the Ostologio man will give me specimens of insects and minerals and think what books I ought to have. He introduced Monsieur Julia to me in the lecture room, who is to come at 10 a.m. tomorrow to give me my first lesson in anatomy. Saw Monsieur Antoine on coming away. He had heard of a little apartment, number seven, Rue du Jardin de Plante, or Troisième. Took him up and drove to look at it. 
At 120, set off to Monsieur Antoine, admitted into his cabinet d'etude, his wife drawing, painting a small wooden table beautifully. Never saw people look happier, quite taken with his nice light study. Pamphlets and manuscripts beautifully arranged in little portfolio, made so as to contract or enlarge at pleasure. Monsieur Antoine then went with me to my little apartment. Ask him and Madame Audouin to tea. Offered to send the carriage. This to be fixed when I got into my apartment. Monsieur Antoine will then try to give me an hour, one day a week, will give me lessons on the mollusks, etc. The next one is Henri Marie de Grotte de Blaveu. He was a zoologist and anatomist. And first he wanted to become a painter and he studied to become a painter. But then he went to Paris and visited lectures of Cuvier and got interested in natural science. So Cuvier became his protégé. Later they had some disputes and they weren't speaking to each other anymore. In 1830, he came to the museum and he became the professor of mollusks, zoophysts, and worms. In 1832, he became the professor of comparative anatomy as a successor of Georges Cuvier, who died 1832. He was the first who used the term paleontology for Cuvier's new field in science, and he also was a member of the Academy. This nice little drawing on the right side of a dodo um, is in the archive of the museum and it's really, really very good painted. Quotes. Monsieur de Blainville seems clear and a good lecturer, but I should fancy him tribava in private life. His catchphrase, which he perpetually repeats, is n'est-il pas vrai? It isn't true. De Blainville, lesson eight. Very interesting lecture, even more so than the last. Stopped to speak to him to ask what book it was he had. Marie Jean Pierre Florent was an anatomist, physiologist, and neurophysiologist. And first he studied medicine, as so many of the other professors, and later natural history. He came to Paris to Geoffroy Saint Hilaire, but in 1815 he became an assistant of Cuvier. He discovered the function of the cerebellum, and so we now know why we can walk. In 1828, he became a member of the Academy, and in 1847, he discovered the numbing effect of chlorethane and chloroform, so that till then, people who needed a surgery hadn't to be conscious during the process. In 1855, he became professor of the Collège de France and a peer of France, so he was really highly decorated and honored. Quotes. Cuvier's course of comparative anatomy and in his absence given by Monsieur Florent began on Saturday at 1 p.m. to be continued at this hour on Saturdays and Tuesdays. Ask if ladies could attend. Yes, certainly. There before the lecture began a minute or two. Monsieur Florent, très bien. All men, three or four rows before me, but I heard and saw very well. Galerie du Poisson. Anything anatomical amuses and interests me. Jean Francois Brissot de Merville. He was a botanist and zoologist, and he became an assistant at the museum in 1796, only 20 years old. In 82, he published about plant anatomy and physiology, and he is called the father of plant physiology and cytology. He also became a director of the gardens of Malmaison near Paris, uh, and these gardens were visited by Anne Lister. In 1808, he became a member of the Academy. Quotes. Went to hear Monsieur de Merville on vegetable physiology. Monsieur de Merville speaks differently from the rest, better, and is more like a gentleman in his manners. 
very interesting and well done, yet somehow I could hardly keep quite awake all the time. Only about half a dozen ladies there. No to Monsieur Monsieur le Baron de Mirbel to ask him for in permission écrite pour s'écouler toujours dans le jardin de roi, a uh, written permission to walk always through the jardin de roi. Alexandre Bronia, by the way, the father-in-law of Monsieur Antoine was a chemist, mineralogist, geographer, and zoologist. Again, a wide mixture of topics. He studied at the École de Mans and the École de Médecine. And in 1803, he became director of the porcelain manufactory in Sèvres, and Anne mentioned his work and this manufactory in her letter to Mr. Duffin from 1819. But later on, she didn't recall this fact as it seems. She never mentioned it again when she met him in person. In 1815, he became a member of the Academy. And since 1822, he was the director of the museum. He also became in 1824, the director of the Musée National de Ceramique. And he was very strongly influenced by Georges Cuvier and he always took his side. He was the first who did systematic studies about trilobites. You can see one here on the right side. And that was important for the chronology of Paleocenic layers so that you can date fossils, etc. And he was the first who described the layers of the tertiary. Quotes, too late at Bonia's lecture. First of this year's course, there from 9.5 to 10.5. Lectures very well, speaks very distinctly, considering he has lost so many teeth. Bronia's 10th lecture on quartz, try, trying first time to repeat the sentence to myself so as to learn French as well as mineralogy. And now for a very handsome guy, Pierre Louis Antoine Cordier. He was a geologist, mineralogist, and petrograph, and he was one of the scientists who took part in the Egypt expedition of Napoleon in Egypt from 1798 to 99, like Geoffroy Saint Hilaire. He was professor of geology at the Ecole de Mans, and also in, the, uh, in 1819, professor at the museum. In 1822, he became a member of the Academy, and he was a founding member of the French Geological Society. Quote, then appeared Monsieur Cordier, and a respectable looking person, not like an assistant with him. Monsieur Cordier read his lecture from loose foolscaps half sheets, which he occasionally unpinned from together. A tallish, thinnish, middle aged man, neither plain nor the contrary, wearing a little skull cap wig the color of his own hair, as does both Monsieur Logier and Monsieur Geoffroy Saint Hilaire. Monsieur Cordier's language, plain and perspicuous, and audibly clearer and sufficiently slowly delivered. The most easily understood at first of any of he, the four lecturers, professors I had yet heard. And now for something completely different. A woman. Sophie Duvancel, also known as Sophie Cuvier, and later when she married Sophie de Cré de Villeneuve. She was the daughter of Cuvier's wife, and it was said that she could have become a scientist herself, but the only option she had was to become a naturalist illustrator, and I must say a very good one. Here on the right side, you can see one of her drawings, and compared to other drawings in the archive of the museum. This is really good work. She worked with Cuvier, who was a very good naturalist illustrator himself, and sometimes for other scientists of the museum. There was never any other interest for Sophie, um, and there was never incurred across thinking of her. 
And it seems that she didn't like Anne Lister very much. Quotes. Called on Madame Cuvier and Mademoiselle de Vossal. Admitted. Said near half an hour. Sometime before Mademoiselle made her appearance. Madame Cuvier in the interim talk, I suppose remarkably much for her, and was indeed very civil. Ditto Mademoiselle. Voilà une connaissance faite. Told Madame Cuvier I should be glad if Mademoiselle de Vancel would go out with me some little occursion into the country. Very civil. No. On coming out, met Madame Cuvier and her daughter and Cuvier's little secretary. Joined them and walked with them to the college. Flattered Mademoiselle de Vancel on her being savant. Madame Cuvier and Mademoiselle de Vancel just going at the same time. She did not seem delighted at my joining them, Miss de Vancel. Monsieur Antoine is right. She prefers breaches. Shall not join them again. Then to Cuvier's, sat about three quarter of an hour with Madame Cuvier and Mademoiselle de Vancel. I think I like the older one better than the young. Somehow they are not Bolton, and I'm almost tired of this sort of acquaintance, though I mean, after all the trouble I had to get it, keep it up moderately. In time for Cuvier's lecture 15 on generation, which lasted one hour, 10 minutes. Very interesting. Madame Cuvier and her daughter, not there. Deterred, I suppose, by the subject. About half dozen ladies. I was too busy writing to look about me. Then called and sat half an hour with Madame Cuvier and Mademoiselle de Vincel. This was in July 1833 after Georges Cuvier's death. Trist, out of spirits as well, they may, but very civil and glad to see me. Gave me the eloge on Monsieur Cuvier and some of his last brochures. I do think maybe Sophie liked Anne not that much because Anne wrote her name so many times so wrong. André Lugier, a chemist, pharmacist, and mineralogist. He became assistant in 1803 and professor of chemistry in 1809, and also in 1829, the director of the École de Pharmacie. He wrote a very important book about chemistry, the Cours de Chimie Générale, and he provided practical methods to separate different minerals. And he died of cholera like Cuvier. You can see he died in 1832. Quote, then at 9.20 was seated behind Lugier at his chemical lecture. The seventh of his present course had begun precisely at nine one quarter. So entirely behind him could not hear well. Lecture over at 10.40. Spoke to Monsieur Lugier on coming away. Asked if he had published any system of chemistry. No. Was there no resume of his lectures? No. But there was this course of lectures taken down by some shorthand writers and published by Pigeon and Didier. The smell of sulfur was very bad, said Monsieur Logier to me on coming away when I spoke to him. You see what it is to attend chemical lectures. Somehow at the two last chemical lectures, I had had all possible difficulty in keeping myself awake in so much that I really have not quite entered into all that I should otherwise have done. With regard to showing how to ascertain the purity of atmospheric air this morning, I was not therefore much the better for it. Monsieur Logier, always very civil. Do you see she not only slept during sermons in church, but also in scientific lectures. René Louis de Fontaine. He was a botanist and first he studied medicine and then botany. And you can see his hands still in the Jardin de Plant, especially in the Col de Botanique uh, that he arranged. In 1786, he became professor of botany at the Jardin de Roi, so before the establishing of establishment of the museum. And in 1793, he became professor of botany at the museum. Went for two years to North Africa and he started plant physiology and show, showed the importance for biology of this topic. Quotes, 
The lecture began at seven and a half. Eight or nine ladies on chairs close to the lecture. The benches well filled. Monsieur de Fontaine, an old man. The students received him with clapping of hands and paid him the same compliment on going away. Odd enough. And here you can see that Anne wasn't accustomed to university um, procedures. Mentioned going to attend Monsieur Audouin's course and attending Monsieur Geoffroy saint -Hilaire's. Monsieur de Fontaine observed I ought not to attend too many courses. I said I should add learned French. After the lecture way late, Monsieur de Fontaine asked if he could recommend me a notaire just hinting the business was straight. Monsieur de Fontaine, very civil, went into his house with him and sat till he wrote me a note to his own notaire, which seemed to be some exertion to him. He seemed to write with more difficulty than I expected, even though seeing him bear evident traces of being Aetatus 80, his hand unsteady. Then to the Jardin de Plan to ask Monsieur de Fontaine for a general admission to be admitted at Libertum to the Serre. Yes, met Monsieur de Fontaine at his own door. No one could be more civil. In 1831, then inquired after Monsieur de Fontaine, quite blind and very feeble. In 1833, then went to the Jardin de Plante, called and sat 10 minutes with poor old Monsieur de Fontaine, now blind from cataract and looking very old and infirm, very glad to see me. And you can see he died the same year. Now I will present you the son before the father. So, this is Isidore Geoffrin Saint Hilaire, the son of Etienne Geoffrin Saint Hilaire, and he was, like his father, a zoologist. He was the first one who used the term etology. In 1824, he became assistant to his father, and in 1829, he lectured for his father when one of his daughters died. In 1833, he became a member of the Academy and in 1841, professor at the museum as successor of his father. Quotes. Lecture 15, Jean-François Hélène. His son lectured first time instead of him from 12 and a half to one and a half. Monsieur Jean-François Hélène felt fatigue by his last lecture. So his son, Isidore Jean-François Hélène, is to finish the course for him. Then went upstairs to speak to Monsieur Isidore Geoffroy Saillet to ask after his father and say how much I regretted having an engagement that would prevent my staying over his lecture and came away. So now for the father, one of the most important scientists at that time. He first wanted to become a priest, but after the French Revolution, he stopped that plan and studied law and then medicine. He became professor of zoology at the new museum in 1793. Mm -hmm. And he was the one who established the menagerie that is still there in the Jardin de Plant. The revolutionists gave the animals of the king's menagerie to the museum to be killed and studied. But the scientists thought it better to study living animals. And so Jean-François Hilaire was the one who had to organize the menagerie. He worked with Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, and you will hear of him a bit later. And maybe he regretted it, but he persuaded George Cuvier to come to the museum. In 1798 to 801, he was a member of Napoleon's expedition to Egypt. And here you can see he stayed longer there than Cordier. In 1807, when he came back to Paris, he became a member of the Academy. And he invented a theory of analogy. He said that all living beings are related. He called it the unity of composition. And this was an early support of evolution theory and that led to a dispute with George Cuvier. In 1830, this led to a scientific debate 
that was noticed in whole of Europe. And even Johann Wolfgang von Goethe wrote about this debate. He is called the father of the teratology, the study of abnormalities. And you can see here on the right a specimen from the museum of um, a lamb with two heads. Quote, Monsieur Geoffroy Saillet is a shortish, fat, fetish person with an effective rhetorical manner of speaking and provincial, though I am not French enough to make out from what province. Spoke rather low at first. Could all those behind us hear him? Had lost a tooth or two. Rather indistinct or speaks rather thick at times. One must be accustomed to him. Monsieur Jean-François Heller threw out some interesting hints upon his opinion sur le développement des parties organiques. He is very civil to me. Went and spoke to Monsieur Jean-François Heller to say I was much obliged to him for the book he gave me on Monday and that I could quite well enter into his ideas. J'entre Monsieur très bien de votre idée. So she was interested in his evolution theory. Lecture 9, Jean-François Hilaire. Monsieur Jean-François Hilaire spoke in coming out, said I had inquired for his book, not published, said he would let me have a copy, went to his house with him, fancying the thing would please, said I should like to have this volume en cadeau, and he wrote my name in it as from the author. And now for the biggest name, Georges Cuvier, father of paleontology and the comparative anatomy. He was a zoologist and anatomist, <clears throat> and he became in 1795 a professor at the Museum, a member of the Société d'Histoire Naturelle and of the Institut de France, all in one year. While Geoffroy Hélère was in Egypt, he became the shining star at the museum. And he was very well connected <clears throat> in the science and in politics. In 1800, he became the professor of zoology. In 1811, he was honored with a Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur, and he had good connections to Napoleon. He held weekly gatherings at his house for scientists and other guests. And Alistair attended some of these soirees. And interesting to see that the father of the comparative anatomy never accepted the idea of evolution. And he died of cholera in 1832, the same epidemic that prevented Alistair to go to Italy with where Hobart. Uh, and led to her to stay at Hastings, a completely waste of time. Quotes, at the Institute in time for a good place, Cuvier with his two or three orders looked as if he felt the king of the place. His eloge interesting in some parts very well done, ditto that of Fourier, but as orator Florent pleased me best. Cuvier's first lecture of this course on les sciences naturelles, he is too large and pale, will not live forever, perhaps lives too well, lectured very agreeable. I was close at his left elbow, his hands very dirty. So she noticed the hands and if people lost teeth. Gave us a sufficient history of the rise and progress of science. Before breakfast, 50 minutes, getting to the Jardin de Rouen. Monsieur Le Baron Cuvier at home, sent in my card with a letter of introduction Comte de Noé gave me on Sunday. Admitted, stayed a few minutes with the first naturalist of the age, very civil and gentlemanlike, gave me a student's pied of admission to the cabinet de soins naturels, asked if he had still his Saturday reunions. Yes, said I should be happy to assist à ces reunions. He should be flattered, etc., etc., and I took my leave and drove home. At Cuvier's in about half an hour, Cuvier seemed this time and the last not either brilliant or amusing or tolerably agreeable in society. Walks up and down the room saying now and then the word or two to the ladies and gents. That politeness seems to require. Cuvier seems quite the lord of the seventh before whom the younger flee. 
not a remarkably pleasant visit. Nothing brilliant on the conversation, neither amusing nor edified. I shall go occasionally, and that is all. I spoke in high terms of Monsieur Cuvier to his wife, and she seemed to show me his rooms with great goodwill. The divisions in his library for so many different divisions or departments of science. His natural history cabinet, a mere garret in the roof, but made very snug and pretty by being papered with that. Broad, dark, blue strip tent like paper and lighted from the top. Three standing desks, each for different papers and subjects, each under a window in the roof. Different skeletons of fish on the tables, very nice and comfortable. <clears throat> the salon, two lined with books. These are literature, history, etc. And this he called the ladies' library. Off at 9.20, two Cuviers got there at 10. Very few people there. Cuvier gave me, I reminded him of his promise to do so, his Decours sur de rouleau sur de la surface du globe. Lecture 13, Cuvier from three and a quarter to four and a half, on physiology and lastly on anatomy. The human uterus, menstrual discharge and penis mentioned. Thought I, Monsieur de Hagemann, will think it all odd enough. <clears throat> so, now about the subject of revolution, the debate between Cuvier and Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire. In 30, one of the most important debates on natural science took place in Paris. Two of the professors of the Musée National du Soin Naturel and favorite scientists, Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire and Cuvier, once friends became opponents over the first ideas about evolution and was witness to this. Though she couldn't attend the meetings at the Académie des Sciences, where the debates took place, but talked about it with Monsieur Antoine and Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire himself, and Cuvier mentioned it in his lectures. It isn't easy to see what Anne might have thought about the opposite theories, because Cuvier's didn't endanger her faith, but her scientific heart, where it was vice versa with Geoffroy's view. There are a couple of entries in the diaries where she wrote about this topic. You may see an interest in Geoffroy's ideas, but also sympathy for Cuvier's deconstruction of Lamarck's theory, and also at one part racism that was very common at that time. But before you hear what Anne wrote about it, I'd like to tell you a bit about the theories. And here you meet Jean-Baptiste Lamarck again. He died in 1829 and he was blind for the last 10 years of his life. So Anne never met him in person, but heard his lectures held by Monsieur Florent. His idea of evolution was that he thought that every living being was driven for perfection, that there were no connections between, between species <clears throat> and he thought of an active adaptation to the environment by using and disusing body parts, organs, and so forth, and then that there was a transmission to the descendants. He saw, thought that there was no extinction, only the one caused by men, and the descendants of animals whose fossils were found were either in unknown parts on Earth or adaptation over the years was so advanced that one cannot see the archetype in the now seen creature. He published his theory in 1809, the year Charles Darwin was born. And when Darwin published his theory 15 years later, Lamarck's theory became obsolete. But nowadays there are discussions if Lamarck's ideas are part of the theory of epigenetics. So this was the man with whom Etienne Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire worked, and they might have discussed uh, these thoughts. So in 1830 and 1831, the so-called Covier-Geoffroy debate took place. The first debate about the possibility of evolution. As said, 
Etienne Geoffrand Sarrelaire thought that all animal structures were modified forms of one unified plan, a unity of composition. Cuvier thought that the animal structure was determined by an organism's functional needs. Uh, he saw four animal groups and non-connections between those. Georges Cuvier liked to stick to the facts, whereas Jean-François Hilaire liked to uh, think in new hypotheses to get on in the scientific world. He also saw similarities between animals and people the, uh, and men, whereas Georges Cuvier always saw the differences. Cuvier thought that there was a transformation of organic forms, and Cuvier said that the animals were perfect for the environment, so they didn't need it to um, uh, grow or to transform in something else. The big argument for Georges Cuvier that there couldn't be an evolution uh, was this arguing with animal mummies and Egyptian graves. He said that the mummies of cats found in those graves were no different from the cats they could see at this time. Jean-François Hélène argued with the development of embryos, which he studied very thoroughly. And there was an interesting fossil found near Caen, and you will hear about in the quotes. And the interesting thing was that Cuvier just said it's a crocodile, nothing else. Whereas Jean-François Hélène said that it was not a crocodile, but an intermediate form between reptiles and mammals. And so his thoughts were the beginning of the evolutionary paleontology. Cuvier, as I said, always denied the possibility of evolution. And he created a theory called the catastrophism theory. He said that there were several mass extinctions caused by floods, not only the one mentioned in the Bible. And that after the flood and after the deaths of the animals in that era, different animals <clears throat> came from other areas so that they are not connected. And so um, there are differences between the fossils and the living animals you can see. So what did Anne wrote about that? We had talked, Monsieur Antoine and Anne, of the difference of opinion between himself and Cuvier. And I told him a lady, did not mention names, it was Madame Galvani, had observed to me that she thought Cuvier was too spirituel en être très savant, too spiritual to be a good scientist. Monsieur Geoffroy Hilaire was not surprised at this remark from a lady, but though he fought off at first, yet seemed afterwards to think the observation just, and does not himself think Cuvier très profond. In Cuvier's lectures, Animals divided into four great embranchments according to the nerve system, long divided into three races, Caucasian, Mongol, and Negro. We are of the first. The last descends greater time into the large orangutan. Here you can see the racism in this theory. Some conversation on the related merits of Jean-François Hélène and Cuvier. I profess my admiration of saint Hélène, in which Monsieur Antoine agreed. But Cuvier is plus adroit, more a man of the world. Saint-Hélène seeks for resemblance and shows the liaison, the connecting change throughout all nature. Cuvier seeks for differences. So and so differs so and so from man. Saint-Hélène says so and so resembles man and so and so. Monsieur Antoine apprétend Saint-Hélène and says so do all men of science. Monsieur de France Saint-Hélène came in said I was really very glad to see him. He mentioned the dispute between him and Cuvier, said I knew all about it. He told me he had a book on the subject just ready for appearing, asked where to get it from. So, and just spoke to Monsieur Jean-François Hélère, walking across from the Galerie du Botanique, part carrying fossil skeleton 
of crocodile found at Caen that he said was bien intéressant, très précieux. Again, in the lecture of Cuvier, treated the question of the Chien des Êtres. This drawn by too great a sketch from Leibniz, who never meant so much, nor chain of being, nor raison en fournie des êtres pour être en groupe, groups divided by hiatus more or less considerable. Then off to the Collège de France, went in with the Cuviers, sur la transformation des espèces, très spirituelle réputation of the ideas of Lamarck, we all loved several times. So here Cuvier destructed Lamarck. At the Collège de France at three, Cuvier's 22nd lecture, a digression of the subject of methods natural and artificial, showing that l'unité de composition, it asked l'identité de partir, Monsieur Geoffroy saint favorite hypothesis, does not exist. Then called on Monsieur Geoffroy saint and sat half an hour with him hearing of his fossil researches at Caen and of his discoveries and theories thereon. The fossil animal found there not a crocodile. The link between a lizard or what and crocodile showed how by a different atmosphere lizards could gradually be transformed into birds and proved that the atmosphere was different dans le temps très reculé. All the great calcerated formations resolved into carbon and calcium and all, animals and all, originally formed as minerals are by just a position. Quite a new theory of the globe, great many English at Caen. Monsieur Geoffrin Sahelaire thought they would be buying up all the fossil remains, but no, not at all. Now well, I would like to switch to the two scientists whom Alistair took private lessons with. And the first one is Pierre-Joseph Pelletier, a bit difficult to find him because she took lessons in mineralogy with him and he was a professor at the Ecole de Pharmacie. Here on the right side, you can see a published work of Pelletier from 1812. And you can see it is something about mineralogy. This is because he was a mineralogist, chemist, and pharmacist, and he started his academical career in mineralogy, and he worked with a very famous mineralogist, Aoi. So in 1815, he became professor at the Ecole de Pharmacie, but still worked on mineralogy. In 1827, he and his colleague, Karantou, isolated chlorophyll, and they discovered many more alkaloids. Most important, quinine, strychnine, and caffeine. And there is a monument in honor of the discovering of quinine for him and Comanchu near the Ecole de Mans. He also was financially independent because he owned a pharmacy in Paris that he inherited from his father. And today you can still see in the Rue Jaco the exterior of this pharmacy. You can still read Pharmacy Pelletier on the, in the front. Quotes. Monsieur saint R named Pelletier of the Accord de Mans. We'll speak to him, ask his terms for a few lessons, et cetera, et cetera. Monsieur Pelletier arrived at the same time from the Ecole de Mans, Rue d'Enfant, first time, to give me a lesson on mineralogy. Sat down to it immediately. The old man brought bra and would read aloud the first 34 pages, which I told him I had just before read. But he would have it was necessary, so it was too dark before we began to examine the few specimen sable de show he brought, and in fact we did, did little or nothing but in trying the electrometer. Monsieur Pelletier came at 5.30, fifth lesson from then to seven, three quarter. 20 minutes trying to use the blowpipe, Monsieur Pelletier left for me today, off at three and a quarter, and about 80 minutes walk to the Ecole de Mans. Monsieur Pelletier showed me the public collection, four rooms of minerals and as many of shells. This collection chiefly arranged under glass and tables, very convenient for study. 
Monsieur Pelletier came before 12 and stayed an hour, talking of his work, Mineralogy Locale, that he is going to publish. A dictionary arranged par espace et par localité of all known minerals, the sort of thing I have long wanted. Bet he would put down my name on the list of his subscribers. And now, what happened at Rue Saint Victor number seven? Today, Rue Lenay number seven. On the picture in the, po the postcard, um, you can see a reddish brownish three story building. This is number seven. And you can also see the same view in 2023. And you see now the building is higher. In my back was announced time, the hospital La Pitié, where Monsieur Julien, the medical student, got the body parts of dead babies. So just a minute away from the apartment, he had to carry the stuff with him through half of Paris, fortunately. So first she wrote his name as Juma. That was definitely wrong. Then she wrote uh, Julia with a T at the end. The Julians of and around Geneva wrote their family name with a D in the end, at the end. And what do we know of Monsieur Julien? We know that he was from Geneva, that he was a medical student, that he wanted to become a doctor and surgeon. Um, and so I looked at information in Geneva and found that one of the buildings of the university hospital is named after an Gustave Julien, who was a doctor and surgeon and who studied in Paris. But unfortunately, Gustave was born in 1836, so this one couldn't be endless as medical student. But his father, born in 1804, studied in Paris as well and wanted to become a doctor and surgeon. And in 1834, Five, as you can see here on the right side, a Etienne Francois Julien published his doctor thesis um, in Paris. And the same year he went back to Geneva. He married, and in 1836, uh, his son Gustave was born. So maybe there still needs to be more research. And Lister's medical student was Etienne Francois Julia from Geneva. And so she would have written his name wrong the whole time. Quotes. He introduced Monsieur Jumin, Julia, to me in the lecture room, who is to come at 10 a.m. tomorrow to give me my first lesson in anatomy. Monsieur Julia came fifth time at 10 and a half and went away at 1.5 at the os temporal, finished with running through the bones of the skeleton in general, had my skeleton out of its case. This seems easy enough. It is the crâne, which is plus difficile. Monsieur Julien came at 10.35, lesson till two. Dissected a rabbit this morning that the coachman got on Tuesday, and Monsieur Julien killed it in my study just before beginning our lesson by laxation of the first vertebra of the spine opened the thorax immediately and saw the pulsation of the heart and then examined the peristaltic motion of the bowels, though the animal was in fact dead. Felt a little queerish to see the poor animal killed and then begin cutting it up directly. Could have been a little sickish had I in the least given way to it. Brought from La Pitié, the right hand of a man, all the while dissecting it. Had I given the least way to it, I should have been sick. Felt very queerish several times. No smell, but somehow the cutting at a hand so like one's own had an odd effect. What seemed worse was showing me the operation of taking off the nail, de Putrin's way of cutting it up the middle and then tearing off each half separately. 
Then Monsieur Julien showed me how he would cut it off with his bisturi. I was all but upset with this. The more the hand was cut and maimed and disfigured, the better I bore the sight. Dawdling over one thing or other till eleven, when Monsieur Julien came and said to two, one quarter, brought a human heart with part of the lungs, very complete, did not feel so much disgust as I should have expected. He brought a woman's hat between 30 and 40, so full of lies, had been obliged to burn all the hair off, and the smell of the singeing and the turpentine prevailed over all other smells. He dissected, laid bare, and we studied. Head arm, studied the five superficial muscles of the anterior of the avant brasi myself, took all the skin off the arm. I get more and more accustomed to dissecting. He dissected the muscles of the throat, a good deal of smell. He put the head and spirits of wine. He did not expect I should have been so soon and so entirely cured. I was the better of the two this morning. In fact, I get interested and begin to feel as if I could perhaps do something by and by. Lesson on the servo, the brain, till 12 and a half. Cut it longitudinally sur la ligne Edian, the middle line. Monsieur Julien stayed talking about Sunday arrangements till one, about another petit enfant and more several. About half hour after he went washing and cleaning the little fetus, etc., the first time of ever doing such thing or ever handling my objet so hardly. Perhaps the disgust will wear off in time, and I shall really get to dissect. Lesson seven, Monsieur Julien, from one three quarter to three one quarter. Smell today, obliged to use chlorure de chaux and sent the thing away after washing, done the lungs and thoroughly examined the two mediastines and hacked away the muscles of the throat to get at the trachea and larynx. Looked in vain for the canatos racic. A fresh male enfant today, rather larger than the last and one that had lived little while. Long while in getting the skin nicely of the arm, but I shall I get to use my bisturi pretty well with a little practice. Then half hour siding, cut off the smelling parts. The basin and one thigh and one shoulder and threw away all. The right arm I had been dissecting, but all into tolerably smallish pieces so as to pass easily and threw through them off and down the privy. Kept only one leg and thigh, one leg from the knee and one arm from the elbow. Lesson 12, another male fetus. I did almost all the dissecting myself. Cut my second middle left finger a little inside the first joint. First time I have ever cut myself at all in anatomizing. So that could have been her end. But fortunately, she survived that. So there were other scientists whom she mentioned or met um, once or twice. Um, like Henry Milne Edwards, uh, Léonce Elie de Beaumont, or Alexander von Humboldt. Quote, Tea a little before 11, and then by and by came the Humboldt, Alexander, the traveler. At all rates, a gentleman and a very agreeable, agreeable little man, speaking very good French and pronouncing a few words very well in English. Talked away and seemed very well satisfied with his company. Next to me, right, Mrs. Opie, left the Sardinian ambassador, and then Humboldt and Mademoiselle de Vincel, then Cuvier and Monsieur and Madame Billot. The two latter very agreeable people. With Nere Boubet, a naturalist, entomologist, and geologist, um, they had a little <laughs> quarrel about. Um, Anne wanted to take private lessons with him, and he wanted her to attend his lectures, and so they never got together. Another interesting figure is Louis Azou, a naturalist and anatomist who made human and veterinary anatomical models, and many, many of them uh, are still in museums, and they are very good. Quote, I drove chez Monsieur Anzou, Dr. Amadison, to see his anatomical preparations, one and a half hour there. 
Really wonderful. A male subject that takes entirely in pieces. Each muscle takes off veins, arteries, nerves, all very well characterized. The brain and the intestines and all the viscera take in pieces. Really, I had no idea of anything so extraordinary. So, at nearly the end of the talk, I wanted to go with you to the cemetery Père Lachaise in Paris because you can say hello to several of the scientists and list in you. You can find the graves of Monsieur Antoine and his wife Mathilde, of Alexandre Brondiard and his wife and his father, a famous Parisian architect, of Cuvier, his wife, his children, uh, Sophie du Vincel and her husband, of Monsieur de Blainville, Etienne and Isidore Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire, and Monsieur Fleuron. And also there is the grave of Guillaume de Putrin, the doctor she visited to get a cure for her venereal disease in 1824-25. So thank you very much for watching and listening. If you like to ask question to contact me, you can see here my contact addresses. Thank you to the West Yorkshire Rife Gift Service call today who had the wonderful idea for these talks during the Alistair birthday festival in Calderdale to the Bibliothèque of the Musée National d'Histoire Naturelle and the lovely people who helped me there and the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. So, bye.